How is everybody doing this wonderful March 10th at noon? My name is Matt Rowe, and I am uh, the owner of Parsley Pet, where we do HTMA diagnostic testing on dogs. And I have the pleasure of co-hosting a show with probably one of the most incredible people I've ever met. Her name is Dr. Judy Jasek. She is the cancer vet. So Dr. Judy, definitely introduce yourself. All right. Well, thank you for the wonderful endorsement there. Um, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, I'm always grateful to have uh, platforms to help educate people. I, I know there's <clears throat> so much confusing information out there these days for pet guardians who really want to do the best for their pets and making it, the best decisions is really confusing. And, um, you know, I have a lot of, you know, over three decades of practice experience and I base my recommendations on that and what I have uh, seen in pets. And I do practice alternative approaches. Um, I always start with nutrition. That's the most important thing. Um, I do specialize in providing alternative uh, treatments for cancer patients, um, such as ozone and mistletoe and other supplements and herbs and different things like that. Um, but I also will help anybody who's interested in a more holistic approach to pet care from starting young puppies out with, you know, minimal vaccines and proper nutrition to, you know, keeping your pet healthy, like let's keep them healthy and much rather be doing, um, you know, pet wellness than seeing them, you know, uh, with cancer. I, I'd really love to begin uh, preventing the the spread of cancer because it's it's just becoming uh, becoming rampant, and it's really sad. It, it's quite tragic, really, to see it happening. It is, and you know, Dr. Judy, I and I use this on a regular basis, but I remember having a discussion, or our first discussions when we met months ago. And you were talking, and I had made the comment that 50% of dogs over the age of 10 will die of cancer. And you looked at me and said, no, man, it's more like two thirds. Yeah, that's where the statistics are going. And you know, and it's not dogs over 10 either. I see dogs younger and younger and younger. I think I've seen a dog now as, as young as 18 months um, diagnosed with, with cancer really sad. Uh, you know, it's just that younger and younger, it's not a old age disease. Um, and it's, it's super sad. And I think in mm -hmm. the younger animals, it's because, you know, pets are over vaccinated, over medicated, they're on poor nutrition, there's a lot of toxins in our world, and mm -hmm. their immune systems just can't keep up with it all. Right. And so this is why I am so honored and excited about this show that we are gonna be doing every Tuesday at noon. So just plan your days if you're watching the show to bring your lunch at noon and jump on and join Dr. Judy and I talk about topics of cancer, food, nutrition, all those elements. And we'll probably touch into toxins. And so we're gonna definitely do a broad array of topics and we're gonna be doing the show, like I said, every Tuesday at noon. And I'm really excited about this show. Yeah, and I'd love be, love to hear some suggestions too from the audience. If people have something, you know, you just would really love to hear us, uh, you know, talk about or, or touch mm -hmm. on. There's so many things out there we can talk about, but we want this to be uh, for you guys. So let us know what you're yeah. interested in hearing about too. I love it. I'm so glad you said that. So, and also if you don't catch the show, as you know, with Facebook, this show will actually be in the video section of Dr. Judy's page and also Parsley Pets page. So without further ado, let's get to it. So we were talking about a topic today, Dr. Judy, does my dog need to eat grain? Yeah. You know, this is becoming so commonplace. And it's just one of the most absurd things I've, I've heard coming out of the profession, um, yeah. quite honestly. And, and especially, you know, because, because of how it got started. So this all got started because of the link between DCM, which is dilated mm -hmm. cardiomyopathy. So this is a form yep. of heart disease that became linked to the grain-free food diets. So, hmm. you know, I think 
I think you have to be really careful when you're looking at data coming out. There's a huge difference between association and true cause and effect. So you can say, okay, there's this population of dogs that have this condition, they're eating this food. Is the food causing it or is there some other factor? And if it is the food, what is it about the food that's causing it? So it became statistically, um, dogs that were eating grain-free or what they call the, you know, boutique foods, the Mm -hmm. non-science diet, non-Royal Canaan type foods were showing a a statistic elevation in dilated cardiomyopathy. Mm -hmm. And so there was this big, big presumption made that's not based on anything that, oh, it must be the lack of grain that's causing this which is absurd to me because there's no grain deficiency in dogs. The one thing that cardiomyopathy has been linked to pretty definitively, we've known this for uh, a couple of decades is low taurine, which Mm -hmm. is an essential amino acid. And this became really um, well known in cats because cats cannot manufacture taurine at all. They have to get it uh, from their diet. So Mm -hmm. years and years ago, I mean, it's probably 20 years ago now, it was you know, found that cats have to have taurine added to the diet. And dogs that are taurine deficient can also develop some degree of cardiomyopathy. Mm-hmm. So, but then what does the grain have to do with that? Because grain is not a source of taurine. Um, well, yeah, go ahead. Taurine is derived from organ meat and I've read that it's the actual heart muscle is yeah. actually a, a really good natural source of taurine. Right, exactly. And that's my thought. You know, I hear this go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Just feed them raw, feed them a fresh mm-hmm. food diet, and they'll have all the taurine, not only taurine, but all the other amino acids and essential right. nutrients. And and what I think honestly is going on is, is so these grain-free foods are still very high in carb, mm-hmm. all kibble. And I don't, yeah. I don't believe there is any good kibbles out there. I don't care how much you're paying for it. I don't care what they say. I don't care what their marketing claims are. They're all about 50% carbohydrate, which gets converted into sugar. They're 50% sugar. And this causes inflammation in the body. And this leads to diseases such Mm -hmm. as cancer, of course, yeah. because sugar feeds cancer, um, right. autoimmune, autoimmune disease, um, inflammatory skin disease, uh, chronic GI issues, all that. I mean, I see pets get so much better all the time being taken off of kibble, but what mm-hmm. they put in the grain-free foods are things like lentils, peas, beans, um, all these different fillers. All kibble has to have a, a filler to form it into the kibble. Right. And if, if you, um, those, those things, those lentils and peas and beans have issues of their own. They cause other problems in the GI tract. They can be very inflammatory. They can lead to things like leaky gut and they have um, phytates in them that can actually bind certain nutrients. And I suspect that, you know, these phytates are binding the taurine. They're, these products, these ingredients are actually preventing the absorption of some of these essential nutrients. It's not about, we need to put grain in. It doesn't even make any sense. If you try to think about that logically, doesn't even make any sense. You need to be feeding a fresh food diet. Look at the incidences of diabetes on the rise and, you know, just overweight pets as it is eating Mm -hmm. really a very sugar packed food. I mean, carbohydrates converts to sugar. And if you're looking at grain free, then you, and I love the point that you made as well as the pea and the lentils have an issue in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract of actually, as they digested, it's, it's having an inflammatory response. Well, then you can throw on another label layer, which is glyphosate. You know, you look mm-hmm. at lentils and garbanzo beans have the highest levels of glyphosate in the industry. Mm-hmm. And, and glyphosate is, is hugely toxic. So mm-hmm. for anybody out there that doesn't know, glyphosate is the key ingredient in Roundup. So mm-hmm. when you see people out there spraying their yards, when you see these 
perfectly groomed, uh, weed-free parks, don't take your dog anywhere near them because those yeah. places are full of chemicals. And I believe this is another big contributor to the incidence of cancer because dogs walk right through you know, the glyphosate outside that's, right. that's sprayed on surfaces. But when they're eating it, um, mm -hmm. it's it, originally glyphosate was um, marketed or patented as an antibiotic. It's, it's devastating for the gut and the microbiome. You know, we're here, that, that'd be another whole topic we could dive into one of these yeah. times. But the, the microbiome, we need the correct balance of bacteria in the gut for an animal to be healthy. <coughs> and um, the glyphosate severely, severely disrupts that. Anything yeah. that kills other things is not healthy and it's going to destroy the microbiome. And I think kibble, I used to be a little more lenient, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I'd be like, well, you know, some kibbles are better than others, better ingredients. I think they're so toxic these days. It, it's, it's dead processed food to begin with. And yeah. now we have this toxicity issue that th there just are no kibbles. And, and you know, I, there's just no excuse to, for feeding or any reason, any valid reasoning for feeding kibble. If you, if you think you can't afford it, honestly, it's pay now or pay later. If you don't get your pet on a healthier diet um, and support their immune system, you're gonna be treating some sort of chronic disease at some point in the pet's life and probably way sooner than you think. And, um, you know, that little extra cost for raw feeding is nothing compared to the thousands of dollars in veterinary bills, not to mention just the heartbreak of, yeah. of seeing your pet get sick. It's, it's devastating. I mean, I see it day in and day out. And that's why I am so passionate about getting the word out about, you know, what really is the, the best diet for pets. Cause I can tell you that um, almost without exception, the cancer patients I see have been eating a kibble diet, either currently when I see them or up until the, you know, recent past, you know, they've, they've been primarily on a kibble diet and, you know, oftentimes over medicated. And, and I think that's, um, that's the, you know, huge, huge, huge issue. So um, we got a little off, little off track on the whole, on the whole grain issue, but um there is no need for grain. There's absolutely no such thing as a, as a grain deficiency. I mean, I've, I have clients that go back in to um, one of their conventional veterinarians that, and then they say they're feeding raw and they'll be told, well, that's fine, but you need to feed them some grain too. There, there's no, no need for yeah. grain. I actually think you can put together a completely healthy diet on animal products alone that we don't need Mm -hmm. any plant products or, or very, very little in the diet. So let's talk about that. So let's say there's a pet parent that is gone, going into their vet and they're doing a regular checkup and the question gets asked, what do you feed? And so when they may mention, I feed raw or a home cooked meal or home prepared meal, how would you combat the, or what questions would you ask in regards to maybe a statement made that, well, your dog needs grain or your dog needs, you know, you're missing some key things in the diet. How, what questions could a pet parent ask that would help with that conversation? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great, a great point. Um, I would ask the veterinarian where they got the information because this is not, substantiated. This is all presumptive, this whole need for grain. You know, it's, it's one of those things, and you see this in mass media all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we get fed things. We're you know, we were talking just briefly about the coronavirus before we got on. You know, there, it, it's not that it's not a real thing and that we don't want to be aware of it, but they're yeah. creating so much fear around it that it's, it's, there's, there's a whole, you know, a whole bunch more issues coming up just because of the fear they're creating. So yeah. when something is said over and over enough times, it becomes the truth, quote unquote truth, whether or not it is. And this happens, right. especially around raw food in the veterinary industry, because there are no proven cases of pets getting sick from raw, not one. Like, show me that 
show me that case where it's been definitively proven that, you know, a pet got salmonella, you know, so the things that I hear are pets can get salmonella or pets can get E. coli or listeria, or I've heard botulism. I heard the other day, uh, somebody was told that raw food is full of intestinal parasites, which is impossible because intestinal parasites come out in the poop. So unless they're eating dog poop along with their raw food, they're not right. going to get intestinal parasites. So, but a lot of people don't question. They take, they say, yeah, it's veterinarian. They should know what they're talking about. They don't question right. it. They just get really confused. But I would ask, where is this information coming from? Because I know where it's coming from. It is coming from these big companies that are marketing the dry food. And they are they're, they're training their sales reps to go out and say these things to veterinarians. They, because that's the way the game is played and how best to get people to stop feeding something or to keep people from feeding raw is to make them afraid of it, right? People are very responsive yeah. to fear. So you tell people, this is going to make your pet sick. Your pet's going to get these horrible diseases or your kids are going to get sick or all the ridiculous stuff I hear none of it is founded. Ask for proof. Just very right. simply ask for proof. Where did, where did you learn that? Where's the research study? Because mm -hmm. th there, there is not a single proven case of raw food making pets sick to my knowledge. And I can tell you, I have seen so many pets get better and healthier. I put my cancer patients on raw food all the time. Whether or not they're on, you know, chemo or radiation, I think raw is so beneficial and it's not laden with bacteria. There's this whole, you know, thing about, oh, raw food is just full of bacteria. It's, it's really not true. The raw food industry is so highly scrutinized by the mm -hmm. FDA. These manufacturers have to produce really, really clean products. And, and right. so the same with the, with the grain, um, Ask them, where is that information coming from? Is there a research study proving that? You know, there was this association between the boutique pet foods and the DCM, the cardiomyopathy, but is there any real proof that dogs need grain in their diet? And, and there isn't. Ask, you know, and ask, ask those questions. Where are they getting that information from? Because it's, yeah. it's truly all just propaganda. Well, take a look at the latest trends. I mean, if you want to really take a look at numbers, I mean, if the way we're feeding dogs is correct, then why are we seeing such a high rate of cancer? Exactly. As you said earlier on in the show that at a younger age, these dogs are getting cancer. And so something tells me that there's something wrong with either the environment, we're giving too many pharmaceuticals or they're ingesting too many pharmaceuticals vaccines that they are now doing once a year and also in the big one is food what are the things that your dog comes across and ingests on a regular basis and one of them that they get more than anything else out there is food and so you're feeding them twice a day and if you're feeding them that meal over and over and that is leading to cancer or that is one of the indicators of or that's one of the cornerstones that leads towards cancer. Why don't you think the industry is taking a look at it? Do you think that these companies got so big that they're really just trying to maintain their market share in there and getting more individuals to buy the product? Or is it just that individuals just, they're like, ah, it's a dog and they just kind of slough it off and they, you know, don't put the oomph into wanting to correct this. Yeah, I think, I think the corporatization of veterinary medicine has a lot to do with this. Mm -hmm. And because the industry has changed dramatically, even in the last 10 years. And I think what you have to think about, you know, you always have to follow the money. When things start to not quite mm -hmm. make sense, you have to follow the money. Because I agree with you, Matt. If you look at this logically, okay, pets are getting sicker, cancer rates are going through the roof, mm -hmm. autoimmune disease. You know, I've been practicing over 30 years and I've seen the trends and, mm -hmm. you know, I see things now we never used to, I mean, used to see a cancer case, you know, 
maybe every other month or something. It was pretty rare, especially I, I started practicing in a rural area where pets were out running around eating, you know, leftovers you know, from their a rabbit every from, once in a while. Yeah, right. Yeah. They're out there hunting. Yeah. They're eating rabbits and squirrels and all those great um, fresh meat. We did not have these cancer rates. So yeah, does this not indicate that we need to be doing something differently? But what is happening, yeah. you do not see nearly as many independent free thinking veterinarians as you used to. It's the corporations, mm -hmm. you see the VCAs and you know, which, and, and actually Mars, the Mars company owns, yeah. owns VCA, owns Blue Pearl, owns Banfield. They own yeah. these, these corporations that you see buying up the clinics are owned by even bigger corporations. And that same corporation owns pet food companies. So it's, it's becoming this huge monopoly that is, is they're looking at the bottom line. They're like, well, how can we, make more money well producing yeah. a really cheap food i mean a food that's very inexpensive to produce because it has no nutritional values and training veterinarians to sell it and telling people that that's that's the only thing that's healthy for their pets and coming up with this you know propaganda like oh they need to eat grain or raw is going to kill your pet making them afraid of other things it it really sadly is becoming about the money. And I've actually heard veterinarians who work in corporate clinics are only allowed to recommend products serv and services that their clinic provides. They're not like, yep. say they believe a pet would benefit from something like acupuncture and they may not do it, but they might be able to find somebody that did. They're, they're getting big trouble if they even talk to their clients about it. So it's not about the health of the pet. And you know that the other sad thing is there's way more money in disease and keeping Sadly. keeping pets sick. And you know, it's the same in human medicine. There's mm -hmm. there's we don't have a healthcare system. We have a disease management system because that's where the money is. So you take something like cancer. What I dig into when I see cancer patients, and I will sit with somebody, your average corporate veterinarian gets about from what I understand less than 10 minutes with their clients. Yes. I, I'm I'm taking an hour or a little bit better because I want to dig in and I want to know where did this likely come from in this pet? Where, you know, and I can usually come up with a pretty good idea. Actually the, it's interesting because I think the pet parents a lot of times know they they figure it out. They kind of know, yeah, mm -hmm. I, my pet, I think got, you know, chemical exposure. I've had kibble most of its life. And, and it's not about, I, I don't, I don't get into these things to make people feel bad. I want, I want them to understand where this is coming from, because then we can eliminate those things. If you can eliminate mm -hmm. some of the things that might be causing it, we're going to be much more effective at treating it on the conventional yeah. side. You know, it's, the average corporate veterinarian, they have seven minutes. They have time for brief conversation and write out the prescription. They're selling yeah. the drugs. And so we just keep treating, 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 treating. I'm digging in and looking at the causes because I want to start making this go away. That's my goal is I want to see, I'd love to see in the next 10, 10 years, see this trend start to reverse because yes. we're preventing it. It's not about treating it. I, mean, I actually do have pretty good success um, mm -hmm. overall stabilizing cancer patients and giving mm -hmm. them a good quality of life way beyond what conventional, what the conventional medicine um, odds are or prognoses. Right. I mean, I see pets go way beyond because they're told, well, if you don't treat with chemo or radiation, you know, your pet's going to be dead in one to three months. And I see pets living way beyond that, you know, routinely. I, I just would like to see pets never getting to that point. I'd love yeah. to not be treating pets with cancer because they're healthy and they're living good quality lives. That's, that's what I'd like to see. So am I in for the money? No, because you know, I can make a lot of money treating cancer patients, but um, I'd rather see them healthy. I'd rather be that's it. pets uh, living long, healthy lives and just supporting mm -hmm. their natural health because the you know, the body can heal. The body yeah. has an amazing ability to heal, but you have to give it the right support. 
Yep. And when you're constantly poisoning it, the body, the body can't heal. And on the conventional side, they never talk about nutrition or other things mm -hmm. you can do. They're just attacking the problem. And so yeah. when you just keep, you know, shooting bullets at a disease condition, eventually you're just, you're right, you're going to run down the body and you're going to poison the mm -hmm. body and you have much, much better results in my opinion, by supporting the body mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, nutritionally and with other things than by just slinging bullets at what it is you're, you're treating. Well, and if you take a look at our health as humans, we, you know, we, I do know that stress does lead to disease or disease. Mm -hmm. And so if our pet is sick, our stress levels go up. Mm -hmm. That costs us thousands of dollars to treat that vet. We don't have that thousands of dollars, but we put it on a credit card, rightfully so, because we want to save the pet. Then all of a sudden that adds another layer of stress. And we go back and we play this game back and forth with chemo and we're constantly worried about our pet, but it's affecting our health along this entire journey of getting one of our best friends that loves us so much in this world better. To, to have that, those feelings again, right when you first got your puppy, that they were excited and happy and not have be in a state of cancer or a state of disease or autoimmune condition. And when you look at the food and how it's leading to that, yeah, I believe that grains in the diet, your dog doesn't mean need. I mean, Dr. Judy, I've never seen a dog chasing your corn down a field. Yeah, right. Or, or, or be out in the yard. I mean, my dog Leo isn't out there tending the garden, making sure that the peas come up in the spring as right. they're supposed to. No, 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 no. He's out there, you know, looking for a rabbit. That's his number one goal is that's what he wants. Right. To they're not out there competing with the rabbit for the garden, right? They're, they want to chase the, chase the rabbit or they chase the rabbit through the cornfield. They're not stopping to eat, uh, you know, eat the right. corn off off the plants and you know and again all of these grains turn into sugar it's and it's been proven from a from a cancer prevention perspective yeah. that sugar feeds cancer um you know metabolically cancer cells have a um dependency on on glucose they have to mm -hmm. have glucose for their for an energy source and yep. when you pull the carbs out of the diet uh, pets get so much healthier because it reduces the the inflammation. There's just no, there's just no biological, there's just no biological need for it right. whatsoever. And you're just starving the, the cancer that's in the body. You're not feeding it anymore. And I love the point that you made on that. Mm -hmm. So for everyone watching, if you are feeding grain, do research, take a look, but really take a look at who created that research. Like Dr. Judy said, is follow the thread of money and look at, is it the big kibble companies or food manufacturers that are making kibble creating the data? Or is this really independent research that's been done by like a Dr. Judy Jassic out there in the market for you to start discovering yourself how to actually have a dog that has less of a chance of coming down with cancer? How do you eliminate those things? So then not only does your health improve, but your dog's health improve and your dog's happiness improve and your dog lives this long, incredible life. I mean, it's the reason why we're in business too. And this is why we do what we do is really, we're not okay with that statistic that 50% of dogs will die of cancer. And now two thirds and even younger dogs are getting shown up with cancer. We're not okay with that. And we know that there's a better way and raw feeding is one of them, you know, watching the environment where your dog walks, you know, making sure that they're not coming in contact with all the fertilizers that, you know, that, you know, like we live here in Colorado, if the grass is green, they fertilize it. Mm -hmm. Grass is not supposed to be green in Colorado. We live in a semi-arid desert. So really ultimately, yeah, grass will turn brown at some point, but really when you look at it, it is overly manicured lawns and overly all the toxins and water and environment and all this stuff but a really good one that you can control is what you feed because you have these things mm -hmm. opposable thumbs i get to open the package leo my dog does not get to open the package he right. would like to 
many it's, times. But. It's it's incredibly easy to, from that perspective, to control our pet's diet because they're not out driving around, but you know, past Taco Bell and the donut shop and have all these Wait, have all like these temptations. What's yeah. that? What do you mean, like my seventeen-year-old? Oh yeah, probably yeah. like that. I can't Comes eat any of that. Taco- I can't yeah. eat any of that stuff anymore. But yeah, the youngsters. No, yeah, are. like yeah, yeah. right. Um, so we do have control and we cannot completely eliminate toxins in the environment. We live in a toxic world. There's, there's chemicals everywhere. There's things in the air, there's things in the water. Um, filtered water, by the way, is also really important. Don't let your pet drink, um, unfiltered tap water, but we can't get away from all of it. So we have to do the things that would prove the things that we can. And the single most important thing is, is nutrition, feeding that. Yeah. Eating that good diet. And another great topic, Matt, that I think we should dig into in one of these episodes is vaccinating because mm-hmm. I think over vaccinating yeah. is a is a huge contributor to chronic disease. So those yeah. are two big things that you can do. Decrease the vaccines. And we'll talk, we'll dig into that uh, one of these episodes and talk about how to do that safely so your pet stays healthy. But that's something else you can do along with feeding an appropriate diet. So if your Mm -hmm. pet does get exposed to an environmental toxin, its body can handle it. The Mm -hmm. body can detox. It has the mechanisms to do that. But when it's so inflamed from a poor diet Mm -hmm. and, you know, being over medicated and over vaccinated, it, it can't, it can't, it's just in survival mode. And I I know this is why our our cancer rates have, have gone up so high. Yeah, I agree. So everybody that's watching, plan on that show. We're going to, you know, maybe next week or the week after to actually um, promote their health and not over inundate them with all the toxins, the vaccines, everything Dr. Judy just talked about. So we want to thank everybody for spending your lunch with us today and uh, just plan on every Tuesday at noon, Dr. Judy and I are going to be talking about topics around cancer and pet health and really getting it to where your dog is thriving in its life because that's what every dog should do they love you so much so why can't we help them thrive so um thank you guys very much for being here and thank you dr judy for taking your time today to sit with me and talk about um pet health and cancer and everything that we're just so passionate about yeah thank thank you matt thanks for hosting i appreciate it oh you are so welcome All right. See you guys later. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everybody.